Hey there, this is Emily Tran, one of the undergraduates of the Summer Institute on Medical Ignorance, and today we'll be talking about one of the techniques used in my lab. Now, when people think of research, they normally think of beakers, test tubes, and lab rats. But research is not limited to what goes inside a climate-controlled room full of hoods and freezers. So, in what other ways is research performed? A lot of research, especially medical, can be done out in the field or even in a hospital where patients can be observed directly. Now, I'm not saying that we do something like put 50 people in two rooms and make one of the rooms smoke daily and the other one not for a couple years and see who develops cancer. No. In my lab, we take information from the cases presented to the hospital daily and analyze the data for any patterns and correlations. This is called an outcomes-based analysis which is a type of observational study. So, how do you design an outcomes-based study? Most of the time, when you think of an experiment, everything is controlled for by the experimenter. Like, all these rats are genetically the same and grow up in the same environment, so I know that any differences between them will be due to the drugs that I give them. But, we can't do that with patients because people are so different from each other. They come in different shapes and sizes and ages and ethnicities and the list goes on and on. But people aren't so different that we can't find any similarities between them. This is why we can do propensity score matching. So, what is propensity score matching and how does it work? First, you take a database like the National Trauma Database or the National Cancer Database and then you request all of the data about the treatment or operation procedure that you're interested in. So using the example from earlier, let's look at people who smoked and those who didn't and see who develops cancer. So now you have to pair up as many people in your study as possible based on some criteria called confounds. These are things that could possibly have an effect on your results like age, gender, race, BMI, and anything else you can think of that could have an effect on your results. So using our lung cancer example, we might also want to match people who live in urban and polluted areas with others who live in similar areas. So by doing this, you increase the conditional probability, or in other words, the propensity score. That means that between two people, you make sure that both of them have an equal chance of getting either treatment. It's as if you randomly gave one patient treatment A and another patient treatment B, this is called pseudo-randomization pseudo because you're not really randomly assigning treatments, but the patients you're looking at both have an equal chance of getting each treatment. So once you have some people in your study who are matched up in everything except the treatment, you can focus on them and compare the effects of the treatment. We can see that these guys here are exactly the same, except this guy smokes and this guy doesn't. So when we look to see who gets lung cancer, we can safely correlate lung cancer with smoking and not something else like gender. Otherwise, it would look something like this. So propensity score matching is important because it helps avoid selection bias by making sure that two people have just an equal chance of getting one treatment versus the other. It helps us determine that whether the results you're getting are due to one group being more inclined to getting the treatment versus the effect of the treatment itself. It's a great technique to use when analyzing events that have already happened so you have no control over them, like patient visits at a hospital. There are some limitations with propensity score matching, however. For one, the more confounds you try to match for, the harder it is it will be to find people who match on all of your criteria. Also, there might be some confounds that can't be matched for and might have an effect on your results. So, what other methods can we use to design an outcomes-based study? This will be have to. This will have to be answered next time. Special thanks to Dr. Joseph Bilal for welcoming me into his lab and providing me with a ton of amazing resources. And thanks to the International Fellows for helping me on my project this summer and teaching me some statistics.